The Australian election. Rupert Murdoch suffers a setback. The planet and climate activists catch a break. Germany's toxic anti-Semitism debate and the blacklisting of Palestinian journalists there. Plus, searching YouTube for an answer on why our journalism is being suppressed. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and examine how news is reported. There has been a changing of the political guard in Australia. Prime Minister Scott Morrison is out, defeated in an election in which climate change and what to do about it played a central role. Having experienced forest fires, floods and droughts, Australians turned on Morrison for his refusal to take this existential threat as seriously as they do. They backed the left-leaning Labour Party led by Anthony Albanese. The new government, a progressive coalition, includes Green Party and independent MPs who promise they'll tackle climate change head on. The outcome also amounts to a rejection of Rupert Murdoch's News Corp which backed Morrison and ridiculed candidates demanding action on the climate. Australia gave birth to Murdoch and his media empire. He's used to setting the political agenda down under. Not this time. Our starting point this week is the aftermath of the Australian election. Together we can end the climate wars. Australia has experienced the impacts of climate change firsthand. Three out of control bushfires are continuing to burn in Western Australia. So many fires, hot spots all around the area. Severe bushfires, significant flooding. Up to 500 millimetres is forecast to fall over the next three days. Weather events that are being fueled by warming global temperatures. Australians went to the polls with those images front of mind, whether it was in their own neighbourhoods or pictures on the nightly news. The dry spell right now in Queensland and New South Wales is one of the worst in our history. Climate change was key this federal election. Climate has finally made an impact, becoming one of the issues to swing an election. We thought it would be the case in 2019. It wasn't, but 2022 delivered. Better late than never for the planet's sake. It is no mystery why the Australian government has resisted dealing with the existential issue of climate breakdown for so long. With an economy partly built on its mining sector, Australia is the world's third largest exporter of fossil fuels. It's in the top 10% of polluting countries overall. That's a lot of jobs and corporate lobbying power. Mr. Speaker, this is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be treasure. scared. The climate emergency and what to do about it is what landed Scott Morrison in the Prime Minister's office in 2018. That and a helping hand from Rupert Murdoch and the news outlets he controls. Morrison's government has failed to take meaningful action on the climate since, despite the bushfires and floods that were obvious to all and deadly to some. Australia has been completely captive um, to uh, vested interests in this space for such a long period of time. Industry groups, particular billionaire mining magnates who like to funnel millions of dollars into the election, as well as our concentrated media market uh, run by Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation. It drives the agenda and it sets the tone and it has a chilling effect on public policy and political discourse in this country. We've seen, you know, Murdoch-owned papers providing a platform for the Morrison government to launch scare campaigns about the cost of living, front page spreads, you know, saying that Labor's climate change targets are going to drive up electricity prices. And a lot of the time, those attacks don't stand up to any real scrutiny. And when, when experts have a look at it, they go, look, there's no basis for these attacks. But when they've been spread on the front page of major metropolitan newspapers, the damage has already been done. Not enough Australians bought into that. They voted out Scott Morrison and his Liberal Party which actually leans to the political right in favor of Anthony Albanese and the Labour Party. The new Prime Minister's coalition will include Greens and independent MPs who made significant electoral gains. 
They did so despite Rupert Murdoch, whose global media empire got its start in Australia in the 1960s through newspapers that made their bed with the mining sector, a steady source of ad revenues. Roughly 60% of the country's media space is controlled by Murdoch's News Corp, outlets that had a clear agenda in this election, demanding a policy of inaction on the climate. The Murdoch press were trying to paint anyone who pushed climate change as a far left greenie. This global warming cult is getting very dangerous. Trying to link them together in a cabal scheming against the government and running this green left agenda, which apparently exists if you support climate change. It made them seem hysterical on something that really is a mainstream issue of major concern to almost everyone in Australia. Net zero by 2050 is not enough for these climate zealots. They actually think that we can do things in this country to change our own weather. And that is so scientifically flawed and full of delusion, it's not funny. The election is a loss for Murdoch. If you watch Sky News, the main TV station owned by Murdoch, they're reeling from the defeat. They have a, a, a very straightforward and, and quality news coverage during the day, but at night they have what has become known as Sky After Dark, which is full of rather rabid commentators. They're very shouty and, and they're very locked into uh, Scott Morrison, etc. and one of them, on election night said, My fellow Australians, welcome to the first meeting of the new resistance. It's here each and every night at eight o'clock. Whilst this might be billed as uh, the decline of the Murdochs, it, it, it really is more a story about the decline of the, the legacy media. Given the irrelevance of the mainstream media outlets, you've seen a lot more interest in the social media space to explore this including in sort of the infotainment or parody space. Honest government as this parody account pretending to be the government talking about climate change that, that went global, really. We know these devastating floods have been hard for you, but they've been hard for us too. They've happened on the eve of an election. So all these different spaces on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, people felt the impacts. They wanted real solutions, and if they weren't getting it from the politicians and from their mainstream media, then they were going to talk about it and elect people that reflected it. Rupert Murdoch and News Corp have grown into an agenda-setting omnipresence, gatekeepers standing between politicians and power in Australia. Half a million citizens have had enough. They've signed an online petition calling for a royal commission, a government inquiry, into Murdoch, his company, and its influence. Having been ushered into office by News Corp, Scott Morrison was never going to agree to that. Now that Morrison's out, and Anthony Albanese has slipped past the gatekeepers and into power, the campaign for an inquiry into the insidious effect Rupert Murdoch has on Australian democracy is making another push. News Corporation has a monopoly of the media market that's completely unseen in any democracy around the world. They're also the single largest employer of journalists. And because of that, journalists are largely unable to talk about what is going on. That's either because they work at News Corp or because maybe you need to work there in the future. I'm really hopeful that the campaign that I run uh, for a Murdoch Royal Commission is able to gain traction so that we can finally get some accountability and uh, some integrity back into the Australian media. So I'm dead against that. You don't start uh, having Royal Commissions into people exercising free speech, alert the consumer market as to the quality of that speech and let them make the decisions. But we'll hear a lot of clatter about inquiries into the Australian media. Rupert Murdoch, I worked for him for 36 years. And he hires a lot of my colleagues and uh, puts bread on their table. So uh, I, I, I'm not totally against him, but I do think that at times he, he lets the rabbits loose when they should be uh, controlled. And I think that's harming both him uh, uh, in a personal and in a corporate sense. But. Uh, he will come back. Nice left, Wendy. Murdoch isn't going anywhere. 
His news outlets are stubbornly sticking to their version of the climate change story. And we will see our living standards crushed. Regardless of which way the political winds are blowing and the brush fires are burning. Because of where they live in the Southern Hemisphere, Australians are ahead of the curve on this story. They are feeling firsthand the effects of the climate breaking down. Perhaps if Rupert Murdoch spent a little more time there and less time in New York City overseeing his media empire, he'd see this existential story the way they've come to see it down under. But probably not. The killing of Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akleh by Israeli forces earlier this month sent shockwaves through Palestine and attracted global media attention. Here at The Listening Post, we continue to provide coverage of that story, but viewers on YouTube are having difficulty seeing our reports. Here to explain why is our digital producer, Stanley Kasseru Ward. So Richard, about an hour after last week's episode was published on YouTube, I noticed a warning slate tagging the show as inappropriate or offensive. Now it's not that unusual for content to be flagged. YouTube and other social media platforms often mark videos that are violent, gratuitous, racist, etc. When we asked YouTube for an explanation, we were first told that our report, quote, focused on gory imagery used in a shocking, sensational, or disrespectful manner. However, take a look at our images. They show Shireen Abu Akleh wearing her helmet and flak jacket with the word press clearly marked, lying dead with her colleague beside her. All of our other footage was of the kind of violence that is frequently covered on this channel and others. In fact, reports about Shireen Abu Akleh from other outlets, such as AP, TRT, and Euronews, all of which had the same kind of footage, did not have the same kind of warnings, until we asked YouTube to justify the warnings put on our videos. It begs the question, does YouTube keep a closer eye on some outlets than others? Another big question is what kind of impact restrictions like this can have. YouTube's algorithm is a bit too much of a black box for us to accurately quantify, but our audience hasn't been quiet about it. Just take a look at some of these comments. What we do know is that momentum is everything on the platform. If users aren't being recommended your videos, your numbers will take a dive. You can see from this graph that once the suppression began, our viewing figures slowed to a crawl. A tip for our viewers who don't want to miss our coverage on topics like the Israeli occupation of Palestine is to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or subscribe to our newsletter. That would be our digital producer talking. Thanks, Stanley. The killing of Shireen Abu Akleh has had repercussions well beyond the Middle East. Take Germany, a country still atoning for the World War II Holocaust, where politicians of all stripes say they have a special responsibility to safeguard German Jews and to support Israel. A vigil for Abu Akleh, set for Berlin, was banned from taking place, as were other pro-Palestine gatherings. For Palestinians in Germany, that is par for the course. Many say they bear the brunt of the country's historical guilt, that legitimate protests against the Israeli occupation get dismissed as anti-Semitic. And if you're a Palestinian or Arab journalist in Germany, prepare to be treated with suspicion, to defend your personal views, even your upbringing. German tabloids are of no help. They have hyped up what they call imported anti-Semitism from the Middle East. And some damaging stories in the media have effectively ended the careers of Palestinian and Arab journalists. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now from Berlin on the discourse around anti-Semitism in Germany. Being a Palestinian journalist in Germany is very scary. The atmosphere is extremely toxic. Your mere existence as a Palestinian is um, in a way being criminalized. It's a provocation for some. Either you stay silent or you decide to speak up. But when you speak up, you have to know that you're going to pay a price for that. In Germany, a decades-long effort to atone for the Holocaust in World War II has often had the effect of suffocating debate on Palestine and Israel. Deutschland an diesem Samstagnachmittag. Israel has Judenhass. 
A prevailing narrative among Germany's media and political elites is that the country has confronted its past. Antisemitismus nicht erst bei der Hassparole, bei der Demonstration anfängt, sondern eben schon bei der Erziehung. In den Satellitenfernsehen aus, äh, aus der Türkei, Al Jazeera. There is a belief that antisemitism is no longer a homegrown problem, but has instead been imported from abroad by Arabs and Muslims. In der Tat ist es so, dass in bestimmten Milieus der Antisemitismus quasi von Generation zu Generation durchgereicht wird. There is something close to a purge going on in Germany, and it's important to know that it isn't just of Palestinians. There are McCarthyite tactics going on, which have also led to many people being quite afraid to speak up. I have spoken up. I believe my job is secure, and I'm Jewish. But I have had many Germans tell me, you know, whispered almost, you can say this, we cannot. You feel constantly observed. There is always people following you very closely, screenshotting what you post in order to then tweet them completely out of context, tagging your employers. And you feel you cannot breathe because the freedom that you need to be a journalist um, is being taken from you. Last year, Palestinian German journalist Nemiel Hassan was about to take up a job with the public broadcaster WDR when an article was published about her in Bild, an avowedly pro-Israel anti-immigrant tabloid. The newspaper was given an image, allegedly from a right-wing blogger, of Al Hassan in a hijab and a kafiya attending a controversial march organized by the Iranian government in support of Palestinians. It was July 2014, during Israel's punishing war on the Gaza Strip. Al Hassan was 20 years old. Three days after the Bild article, an apologetic Al Hassan met with Germany's largest news site, Der Spiegel, for an interview that read more like an interrogation. She was questioned on her family and her beliefs and said she changed a lot since her youth. Al Hassan never got her new job. It was a follow-up article by Bild on her social media likes that sealed her fate. People uncovered likes on social media for a Jewish voice for peace, a big Jewish-American group that uses terms like apartheid. If a term like apartheid that is actually you know, used by several human rights groups is being labeled as anti-Semitism here in Germany, things are simply becoming absurd to a certain degree. Nimi El Hassan was kind of publicly executed and everyone stood by. This was about destroying Nimi El Hassan as a symbol and it sent a very clear message that there is no space in Germany for Palestinian legitimate narratives and to employers, be aware of whom you work with. Germany's most influential newspaper, Bild, and its parent company, Axel Springer, play an outsized role in setting the tone on this debate. We asked the paper for an interview. They declined. In a statement, they told us, critical reporting on anti-Semitism in any form should be the basic consensus of all free media. Of course, it is possible to criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic. However, we find that criticism of Israel is often not much more than poorly camouflaged anti-Semitism. Bild Zeitung is the largest paper in the country. It's a right-leaning tabloid that has, since its inception, insisted that its representatives swear an sort of a loyalty oath to the state of Israel. But there is mu Muslim anti-Semitism. I mean, let's be honest, that exists. But the, the most virulent and the criminal cases of anti-Semitism are not primarily caused by Muslims. 90% are committed by white right-wing Germans. And that is not something that Springer or most of the German press is uh, focusing on at all. 
Six months ago, the Deutsche Zeitung, a centre-left paper, reported on cases of alleged anti-Semitism as international broadcaster Deutsche Welle. DW then launched what it called an independent investigation. Dozens of Arab journalists were questioned, including on their personal politics. Seven were eventually fired. A few had made comments that were anti-Semitic. The others say they were purged, that DW found them guilty by association. It's completely out of debate that if a journalist posts anything anti-Semitic, racist, xenophobic, that he will have to lose his or her job, yeah? There is no discussion about that. But I know people who lost their job during this investigation for really no reason. No reason. It was very clear that they were in that interrogation for the mere reason of having Palestinian origins. They had to reply to questions on their views on Hamas, uh, on the one or two state solution, on the BDS movement. Most Germans don't see how scandalous this is. To make an investigation on anti-Semitism within Deutsche Welle focusing exclusively on Arab em employees is so racist by itself. Few societies are more hyper-vigilant to the threat of anti-Semitism than Germany. The history of the Holocaust has shaped both Germany's identity and its moral purpose, but it has also resulted in uncritical support for Israel. In 2019, the German parliament passed a non-binding resolution, a declaration of intent, condemning the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, or BDS movement, as anti-Semitic. That quickly created an atmosphere of paranoia and political inquisition. Which leaves the Palestinian community here in this Arab neighborhood of Berlin feeling vulnerable, afraid of speaking out about their own experiences of Israeli violence, occupation and dispossession, with the risk of being labeled an anti-Semite. Germany is home to one of the largest Palestinian diasporas in Europe. It may also be the most silent. The problem is that if you reduce German identity to not being anti-Semitic, then you're very open to the sort of efforts that uh, the Israeli government very deliberately puts out that any criticism of Israeli policy is anti-Semitic. And Germans are extremely vulnerable to that kind of message, and they've basically swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker. There is a kind of desire in Germany to exonerate oneself of even the kind of suspicion of uh, anti-Semitism by kind of externalizing that sense of anticipatory guilt uh, on, on, on people, on foreigners, on people who come in from the outside, quote unquote. Germans very much like to praise what we frame as Vergangenheitsbewältigung, you know, the kind of like dealing with the past, but we have to be very wary of anti-Semitism where actually it occurs, but not to sort of simply externalize it and, and, and think that this helps anybody, be it Jews or, or anyone else. I'm half German, half Palestinian. I was born and raised in Germany. Uh, I'm very, very aware of Germany's dark history. For me, it's surreal to see how the term anti-Semitism is being misused to silence Palestinian legitimate narratives, to silence Jewish individuals and Jewish organizations if their narrative does not fit the German narrative. In Germany, we have Nazis in the police. We have right-wing terrorist attacks by Nazis. Anti-Semitism is real, and shifting the, the whole debate on anti-Semitism towards silencing people who speak up for Palestinian human rights is really, really dangerous because it downplays the real threat of anti-Semitism and racism. And finally, almost 60 years ago, the German-Jewish author Hannah Arendt 
wrote about the fearsome banality of evil that underpinned the Nazi movement that carried out the Holocaust. It is a phrase that echoed again this past week with the release of what's being called the Xinjiang Police Files. This huge trove of data was hacked from internal police networks in Xinjiang and handed to Adrian Zenz, a researcher based in Germany and one of the most productive academics investigating through open source data and leaks of classified documents exactly what is happening in Xinjiang. They, for the first time, give us uh, a first-hand account of police operations inside re-education camps, of images taken during police drills, uh, security drills in these camps. This week's data leak was published in full and translated into English on SinjangPoliceFiles.org. It confirms previous reports and adds an unprecedented level of detail. For example, thousands of prisoners' files putting names and faces to the victims. Documents instructing guards to shoot to kill would-be escapees. And transcripts showing that senior officials in Beijing not only have full knowledge of what is happening, but are directly involved. Investigating, verifying, and reporting on this leak was the work of a consortium of international news outlets. You can find all of their coverage in multiple languages in the media section of XinjiangPoliceFiles.org. For a visual treatment of the story, we recommend this interactive feature by BBC News. It combines the leaked information with satellite imagery to reconstruct the internment camps. One leak of data handed to investigators who combined to create some vital journalism on internment camps in Xinjiang that China's communist leaders first insisted do not exist and now call re-education camps. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.